Hi class, in this recording we're going to talk about calcium homeostasis within the bone. This calcium homeostasis, and to a lesser extent, phosphorus or phosphate homeostasis, is going to be related to the mineral or the inorganic component of the bone. As we look at our bones, let me get my pointer up here. Pointer options, laser pointer, boom, there we go. So as we're looking at this mineralization of the bones, um, we are going to look at our bones and first find the organic, the collagen fibers that are going to move or spiral around or move around the perimeter of the osteons um, within the lamellas. And these fibers serve as nucleation sites. Um, and for me in particular, I was introduced to the term nucleation site with the Mentos and Diet Coke experiment. If you're looking for something to, fun to do in your free time, throw a couple Mentos in a bottle of two liter bottle of Diet Coke. You'll enjoy the process. Uh, back on topic, though, these collagen fibers are nucleation points that serve for sites that the calcium and the phosphorus-based minerals, primarily calcium hydroxyapatite, can precipitate out of solution and crystallize onto. These hydroxyapatite crystals are going to concentrate both calcium and phosphorus into the extracellular matrix. The very first few crystals are the hardest to form, but once we get those first few crystals, we're going to have rapid crystallization or rapid mineralization of that extracellular matrix. So we can reabsorb in addition to depositing our bones. So during this reabsorption process, we're going to have osteoclasts releasing um, hydrochloric acid, and that hydrochloric acid is going to dissolve the extracellular matrix of the bone and release the calcium back into the bloodstream. There's also going to be a protease. Protease is an ACE for enzyme, prote for protein. It's an enzyme that destroys proteins that is only going to be activated in acidic environments. So acid protease is going to be activated by the hydrochloric acid and dissolve the collagen fibers within the extracellular matrix. As we're looking at this process, we could have, um, just for an application purpose, we could have orthodontic appliances or braces. I personally had braces for three years, so I'm very familiar with this process. And these braces are going to reposition our teeth through both reabsorption and deposition of the bone tissue by applying mechanical force. So the mechanical force placed on the teeth and the roots of the tooth <coughs> excuse me, are going to cause the osteoclasts on the ahead of the tooth to be just to dissolve compact bone tissue and the osteoblast on the leeward side or behind the movement will deposit compact bone tissue to make it so the tooth doesn't move backwards. To maintain calcium homeostasis, relatively constant levels of calcium in our body, we are going to have multiple hormones and, uh, and feedback loops involved. Calcium is going to receive the majority of our conversation right here. To a lesser degree, phosphate will receive a conversation, PO4 with a negative three charge. It has a lot of uses related to nucleic acids and as a blood buffering system, but let's focus on calcium. We need calcium to release neurotransmitters from both neurons, um, and for those neurotransmitters to be properly, um, and for the electrical activity within the axon terminals to be properly transmitted. We need calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum of muscles to initiate muscle contraction. We need calcium to initiate blood clotting. It interacts with many of the factors, in particular factor five within the, bone, within the blood clotting cascade. And we also use calcium to trigger exocytosis. So this is, could be thought of as the release of neurotransmitters. This calcium and phosphorus are going to be deposited in the skeleton of the bone and stored there long-term, only to be withdrawn later when we need them in our bodies. So a lot of times students will ask me, why do people develop osteoporosis when they're older? Why do their bodies constantly remove calcium from their skeleton to the point that they have a very weak skeleton. The answer to that question is, is we're choosing the lesser of two evils. Our body decides it's more important for our brain to function. It's more important for our heart to pump blood than it is for us to have a strong skeleton. And that's why a lot of times individuals develop this disease, osteoporosis, as we age. Now, if we look at the amount of calcium in a typical human adult, we're going to have about one kilogram, 1.1 kilograms.
of calcium. Most of the calcium is going to be in the form of hydroxyapatate. We're going to have a little bit of calcium into various other forms of calcium carbonate or in CA positive two ions dissolved in our bloodstream. As we're looking at regular homeostatic levels of calcium in our bloodstream or blood plasma, we typically are going to have calcium in the bloodstream ranging from values between about nine to about 10 and a half milligrams per deciliter. This calcium can diffuse very easily and quickly across capillary walls. Um, and this is good because we need to get it to the site that it's needed in particular, that nervous tissue or that muscular tissue. We're also going to have some calcium in reserve bound to plasma proteins so that can be readily available to the blood clotting cascade or if we need to redirect it to the nervous or muscular tissues. If somebody does not have enough calcium in their bloodstream, that is known as low blood calcium or hypocalcemia. Hypo referring to below the normal level. So if we don't have enough calcium in our bloodstream, the membrane voltage, the, vo the electrical charge across our cell membranes starts to become altered. In particular, our nervous system is going to have, our mu muscle membranes are going to have an elevated voltage. This is going to cause our nervous system and muscles to be overly excitable. We're going to have excessive muscle spasms in response to this. Every once in a while, somebody will have a laryngospasm. This laryngospasm is an out of control or uncontrollable contraction of the muscles associated with the larynx that could potentially cause suffocation if it goes unchecked. <coughs> Low blood calcium can be caused by a couple different things. Oftentimes, it's just from not eating enough calcium. It also could be caused by a vitamin D deficiency, dietary vitamin D deficiency, um, excessive diarrhea, thyroid tumors, um, particularly the thyroid tumors associated with the hormones that regulate our calcium levels, and the parathyroid gland as well. Again, there's a hormonal link we'll talk about in just a little bit. If somebody is pregnant, they're going to be removing calcium from their skeleton and adding that calcium to the child's skeleton as that child is growing in the mother's womb, or if that woman is lactating, a lot of times she needs to remove calcium from her skeleton in order to put the calcium into her breast milk for her child. If somebody has too much calcium, that is hypercalcemia. Somebody that has hypercalcemia is typically going to have muscles that are less excitable and uh, the voltages across their membranes, the muscle and nervous system, nervous tissue membranes are going to be depressed. This is going to cause, make it, or cause um, some mild emotional disturbances, but mostly what I want to emphasize is as the membrane voltage is lowered or hyperpolarized, we'll have sluggish reflexes. It's harder to initiate nervous system electrical activity, muscular system electrical activity. Um, I have a couple family members who, when they were in college, ate way too much cheese and they got kidney stones because they had way too much calcium in their diet. Um, living in Wisconsin, um, that's something that happens to people in this state because we love our cheese curds. Hypercalcemia, though, is pretty hard to have occur. Um, you have to eat incredibly large amounts of dairy products, typically, that have hypercalcemia become a problem. As we're looking at the balance, that, that dynamic equilibrium of calcium in our bodies, we're going to look at dietary intake, urinary and fecal, fecal losses, and then just whether or not we store it in our bones or have it really available in the soft tissues of our body. There are three hormones that we primarily are going to use to regulate blood calcium concentrations, calcitrol, calcitonin, and parathyroid hormone. And I'll talk about all three of those. Um, as we're looking at calcitrol, calcitrol, um, to really summarize calcitrol, is going to cause us to absorb calcium. It's going to promote the absorption of calcium from the digestive tract into the bloodstream. Calcitrol is also going to help us to reabsorb calcium from the kidneys or not lose as much calcium in the kidneys to urine. Parathyroid hormone also has the same effect as well. Calcitrol is also going to help us to weekly store more calcium within our bones. And then as we're looking at calcitrol, every um, the calcitrol and parathyroid hormone primarily are going to be associated with reabsorption of calcium.
from the osteo class. So the things that I really want to emphasize here is that calcitrol, more than anything else, causes blood calcium levels to go up. We'll primarily absorb more calcium from the digestive tract. And when we think of calcitrol, think of the most active form of vitamin D. And calcitrol also is going to promote osteoclast activity so that we are going to have more calcium removed from the bones and dumped into the bloodstream. So calcitrol, that most active form of vitamin D, is going to be formed when ultraviolet radiation impacts the skin. And that ultraviolet radiation is going to take some precursor forms of vitamin D, and those precursor forms of vitamin D are then sent to the liver. From the liver, they're processed. There's a hydroxyl group added. And then from the liver, it's sent to the kidney, where there's another hydroxyl group added. And then finally, after the kidneys, we now have calcitrol. And we want, I want to focus primarily, more than anything else, that calcitrol helps us to absorb more calcium from our digestive system and also helps us to absorb reabsorb calcium from our bones or promotes the osteoclast activity to a lesser degree the osteoblast to help offset that bone dissolving activity as we look at calcitrol and we really want to spell this out there calcitrol raises blood calcium so it causes blood calcium concentrations to go up Chiefly, calcitrol is going to make us absorb more calcium in our small intestine as opposed to defecating out more calcium. As we look at calcitrol, it's going to stimulate our osteoblast to release that precursor signaling molecule we talked about in a previous recording, Rancol, and that's going to product, um, stimulate the production of more osteoclast. More osteoclast will then result in more compact bone tissue being dissolved dumping the calcium into the bloodstream. If we don't have enough calcitrol um, in our bodies, we also are gonna struggle with bone deposition. And this is kind of counterintuitive. Not only do we use calcitrol to increase blood calcium concentrations, but let's think of it, let's focus over here. If we don't have enough calcitrol, we don't absorb enough calcium from the small intestine. So ultimately, calcitrol is going to increase the total amount of calcium in the body within our fluid cavities of the body. So if we aren't getting enough calcium or getting enough calcitrol, we aren't going to absorb enough calcium. And ultimately, we're going to have a tough time depositing enough calcium into our bones. And if we don't have enough calcium in our bones, the bones start to become bendy or soft. In children, this is known as rickets. In adults, this is known as osteomalacia. Here's a picture of that bow-legged syndrome, somebody who has rickets. So the long bones of the legs, particularly the tibia, which is exposed to a lot of weight, is bowing outward because it doesn't have enough calcium embedded within its extracellular matrix. The next hormone is calcitonin. Calcitonin is secreted by C cells, the clear cells of the thyroid gland. And we typically are going to use calcitonin when we have too much blood calcium. So to contrast, calcitrol raises calcium levels in the body. Calcitonin lowers calcium levels in the body. And it's going to lower calcium concentration in two ways. And this is oftentimes um, miscommunicated by a lot of high school anatomy and physiology teachers. Calcitonin inhibits osteoclasts. So if the osteoclast is not going to dissolve the... if we osteoclast dissolves the bone and we downregulate osteoclast activity, we are going to not dump as much calcium into the bloodstream. Osteoblasts build the bones up. So if we are stimulating or upregulating osteoblast activity, we're going to find that our bone calcium concentrations are going up and our blood calcium concentrations are going down. Calcitonin plays a very important role in regulating calcium levels in children. In particular, us and children is going to help the children remodel their bones very quickly. Um, calcitonin has been thought to inhibit bone loss in pregnant and lactating women. Um, there's still some research being done on that. There's a little bit of indecisiveness in that field right now. Email me if you have some follow-up questions on that topic. So let's look at these negative feedback loops that we've talked about so far. If we have calcitonin, Calcitonin is going to cause, so the signal is going to be, the stimulus is too much blood calcium, 
we release calcitonin in response to too much calcium. And then ultimately that calcitonin, the response is to lower blood calcium. So it's because the response is opposite of the stimulus, we have a negative feedback loop for a calcitonin to regulate blood calcium levels, particularly to correct for hypercalcemia. Our last hormone that we're gonna talk about is parathyroid hormone, PTH. Parathyroid hormone is secreted by the parathyroid glands, which are located on the posterior, kind of posterior medial surface of the thyroid, and they're embedded just a little, partially embedded within the surface of the thyroid gland. Parathyroid hormone is going to be released when calcium levels are low in the blood, and because it's released when calcium levels are low, and this is a negative feedback loop, parathyroid hormone will raise calcium levels. So this is another way, in addition to calcitrol, we can have parathyroid hormone raising blood calcium levels. Parathyroid hormone, unlike calcitrol, is not going to focus on the digestive tract. Um, instead, parathyroid hormone is going to focus on osteoclast activity. Uh, it's going to focus on increasing osteoclast activity so that we have more bone dissolve. Our bones are going to have an increased rate of dissolving. Parathyroid hormone is going to promote calcium reabsorption by the kidneys so that we have less calcium entering the urine. We're also going to promote the production of calcitrol. So uh, parathyroid hormone is going to enhance the calcium raising effect of calcitrol. And then finally, parathyroid hormone inhibits collagen synthesis. So if we inhibit collagen synthesis by the osteoblast, we're no longer going to have as many nucleation sites for the inorganic component of bone to crystallize on. And if we downrate the rate of, if we downregulate the rate of crystallization, we inhibit bone deposition, which is another way of saying we inhibit the rate that we deposit calcium into our bones. So parathyroid hormone can raise our blood calcium levels with four very unique mechanisms. Let's look at these in pictogram form or picture form. So if we have low blood calcium, parathyroid hormone makes our osteoclasts more active. So we dissolve our bones and raise calcium levels. It reduced osteoblast activity, which makes it so that we are less likely to store calcium in our bones. It makes us absorb more calcium from our urinary system up down here so that we raise calcium levels. And then it also is going to cause more phosphate to leave our body through the urinary system, which makes it difficult to make calcium hydroxyapatate, which is also going to be directly connected to the loss of the collagen from the osteoblast, ultimately reducing bone deposition. The last component of the inorganic component of bones, or the last mineral we're going to focus on, is the phosphorus or phosphate. A typical human adult is going to have between half a kilogram to 0.8 kilograms of phosphorus in their bodies. Most of the phosphorus, just like with the calcium, is going to be stored in the bones. I'm not very interested in the specific numbers here. Just know most phosphorus is stored in our bones. As we're looking at the phosphorus in our bloodstream, we'll have between three and a half and four milligrams per deciliter for our homeostatic norms. And this phosphorus is going to occur in two forms. We'll have a monohydrogen phosphate and a dihydrogen phosphate. <coughs> a lot of times students are going to get phosphorus and phosphate confused with each other. Phosphorus is just one phosphorus atom. A phosphate is one phosphorus atom with four oxygen atoms covalently bonded to it. So we have a, a polyatomic ion, a phosphate, versus an individual mineral ion, the phosphorus. So as we look at phosphate, which is really how most phosphorus is present in our bodies, phosphate levels are not very tightly regulated like calcium levels because it's not quite as important for nervous system or muscular system activity. As we look at that hormone calcitrol, it's going to raise phosphate levels in our bodies by promoting absorption of phosphate in our small intestines. And parathyroid hormone will lower phosphate levels by promoting the excretion of phosphate in the urinary system. We make it so that we urinate out more phosphate. Something else that affects our bones is going to be just a wide variety of other hormones, vitamins, and growth factors. We aren't going to list them all right now. There's at least 20 that are well known at this point. 
as we look at bone growth in particular, um, during puberty, we have very rapid bone growth. And that's because of a lot of hormones that are associated with that. Uh, human growth hormone, estrogen, and in particular, especially testosterone, are going to promote ossification. These three hormones of puberty are going to cause there to be many more osteogenic cells. This, as we have more osteogenic cells or bone uh, pre uh, precursors for the osteoblasts, we're going to have more osteoblasts being made. And then that will cause much of our compact bone tissue to have hypertrophy or rapid enlargement of the bone tissue. As we're looking at this process um, of bone growth, because girls typically hit puberty a few years before boys, they're going to go faster um, than boys. So think of you know, typically like 10 to 12 year old girls are going to be taller, generally speaking, than their 10 to 12 year old boy counterparts. And a good reason for that is because that surge of estrogen the young ladies have is going to have a very strong effect on bone growth, stronger than testosterone. Males are going to grow for a longer period of time, and they're also going to grow taller. And one of the reasons for that is because they have that a higher level of testosterone in their bodies that has a lesser effect on the bone growth than estrogen. But because there's that longer exposure to testosterone, they're going to continue to grow for a net longer period of time. Something else that, that is going to cause our bones to grow and regulate our calcium and phosphorus levels in our body is anabolic steroids. And when we think of anabolic steroids, these are steroids that promote the growth of tissues. Um, these anabolic steroids can cause rapid ossification. And this is one of those, you know, Goldilocks things. We don't want too much, we don't want too little. If we have just the right amount of these hormones in our bodies, we can grow really big, really tall, and really strong. This typically happens automatically when we hit puberty. Sometimes, though, if we artificially inject ourselves with these anabolic steroids, we're going to upregulate ossification, fat more than we upregulate the formation of cartilage. In other words, we are going to cause the epiphyseal plate to have too much ossification. It will close prematurely and turn into an epiphyseal line. Um, so if we're looking at a um, young child, a young, typically it'll be a young athlete, so, um, a young man, boy or young girl, um, and if they take these anabolic steroids, they can have an abnormally short stature because of premature clo closure of their epiphyseal plate. So this is a bit longer of a recording. I want to get the entire concept into one recording for us. We talked about calcium and phosphorus homeostasis, the hormones that regulate calcium and phosphate homeostasis, and then some other miscellaneous factors that regulate it as well. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. And as always, happy studies.